Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. Well, Heidi, we've got a great show today because we're going to be talking about healing after trauma. And Heidi and I had a really intense experience recently because we went down to Parkland, Florida and with some friends, and one of them's here today, and uh, did a healing day with the families down there and with the community. Well, like you said, Mom, we're gonna talk about healing after trauma with two experts who work a lot with people that have had traumatic losses and gone on to find hope. And Mitch Carmody is gonna be one of our guests, and like you said, he just organized and coordinated an entire day of hope and healing with the Bobby Resiniti Foundation uh, down in Parkland. Mm -hmm. And we worked with, you know, Parkland, the, the teachers, some of the students, uh, the vice principal, and it was an incredible day. some of day. the parents. Some of the parents. It was an incredible day because we brought in not only people that could speak about loss and trauma, but people that had could do art with people that have had trauma. There was drumming, there was Reiki, there was massage. So there was a lot of different, there was therapy dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about with Mitch about that. And then, and I want to say mm -hmm. that you also get involved in a situation where there's a lot of trauma because you just come back from TAPS, the tragedy, uh, tragedy assistance program for the military. That fabulous Bonnie Carroll started this program. She's an amazing person. And she uh, had a military loss and she was in the military and right. realized that there wasn't enough for families and uh, support. And she came in as a private citizen basically by then, and she's received uh, an award from President Obama and on and on. And uh, we'll talk about the person that's representing TAPS today, Heidi. And we also right. want to show a video of the Bobby Resonini Foundation that we went to and talk a lot with these two experts on trauma and dealing with it. Right, and so uh, we're both on the, the advisory board at TAPS, and Catherine Costello is going to be the person that is going to represent military loss today. And she has won a prestigious award with TAPS, and we're gonna talk with her about, like you said, working with people that have had traumatic losses. So let me introduce both of our guests, and then we'll kind of you know, t touch base with them. Mitch Carmody, we have had him on hey, many Mitch. shows. We have had him on many radio and television shows. We have worked closely with him for almost 20 years at the Compassionate Friends. I served on the National Board of Directors with the Compassionate Friends. Um, he does all his work in honor and in tribute of his nine-year-old son, Kelly, who died of cancer, and his 28-year-old twin sister, Sandy, who died in a car accident, along with her two children, who also died in a car accident. He has had many, many losses in his life, and he also had his 21-year-old brother that died. But I've got to say, despite all that, mm -hmm. he has found hope and joy, and he lives an amazing life, speaks all over the country. And um, goes down and helps people with trauma. <laughs> yes, and he has he has a radio show called Grief Chat, mm -hmm. and he has written a great book called Letters to My Son. And he's a fabulous artist, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, And he some is. of the pictures, are there pictures in your book, Mitch? Yes, and in the slideshow, actually, in the video with Bob's. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. And then we're gonna talk with Catherine Costello. And like I said, Catherine works with TAPS and has for years and just won a very prestigious award at their national conference over Memorial Day. What's the name of the award, it's Catherine? the Community Care Supporter of the Year. Congratulations. Thank you very it much. Was awesome. It was a very big deal. Um, she is a licensed clinical social worker, social worker as am I, and she comes from a long line of military family members. Mm -hmm. This was interesting to me. Three of her grandparents served in World War II. Three. So I had to wrap my arms around that. I'm like, three? Her two grandfathers, and then who? Her grandmother also. Oh, my goodness. Which I think is amazing, because that was wow. a time where there wasn't a lot of women in the military. Well, I come in the next generation, because my dad served in World War II, and your grandfather. Absolutely, and my <laughs> son is set to deploy in a couple of months to Afghanistan. Wow. So we yeah. are no strangers to military. Um, Catherine's husband also was a Marine for 10 years, and she works for the United States Army Reserve's Psychological Health program. She's a your health program director mm -hmm. at the United States Army Reserve Psychological Program. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm a defense contractor, and I oversee the program for psychological health for uh, reservists, and also from I also oversee a military and veteran program for transitioning veterans it's, as a defense contractor. Wow. So wow. she is no stranger to the military, and I like that you've had the professional. You know, you've been in it professionally and personally. 
It's, I think that's a big I value. Too. So let's get to talking about trauma. And yes. wow, Mitch, talk, why don't you start out talking a little bit about the Parkland tragedy and our friend Bob Rissanini, who is, li lives in Parkland. And did, is, it, is it Parkland that he lives in? Yeah, he, yeah. Well, he lives a little further north near Boca. Okay. But, but he his knew foundation the people at the is, school. He went to the school, didn't he? Did he? His, his children went to the school, and his, uh, he's about, the school is about less than three miles from his foundation building, which mm -hmm. is a brick and mortar that thing, 10 years ago that he built for the community. And he did that, why? Well, uh, his son died 12 years ago, Bobby, and he decided that he, I don't know if he contacted the Compassionate Friends or what happened, but he decided there wasn't enough being done for bereaved parents. And so he decided, well, I'm gonna start a foundation and name my son, Bobby Resiniti. So he called it the Bobby Resiniti Healing Hearts Foundation to help, Early on was just for families who had lost a child. And then he, as, as the years progressed in doing this memorial walk, the first year we did a memorial walk, it was we had like 75 people. And I've been at every memorial walk for the past 10 years. This year we had 1,000 people. And initially it was just children who had died. But now we have every, any loss. I mean, there's dogs and there's horses and there's any loss it have that people can once a year put a thing in the ground and say, you know, I want to remember. So this year, when did you get the phone call from Bob that this has happened down in Parkland? Oh, that was uh, <laughs> an amazing thing because I was doing a cross-country tour with Alan Peterson on the Angels Across America tour. And he, we drove from San Diego to uh, Orlando all the way across the southern U.S. And when, on the way there, we stopped at, um, in Sutherland Springs where the 26 people were murdered in the church. And, and we, had, we, we went and talked to them and they allowed us permission to go into the church actually. And, uh, it see, and I saw this church was just painted solid white with 26 white chairs with a red rose on yeah. each chair. And there was no, but that was it in the town. No one talked about it. Very small town. It's, they made a memorial, but there was didn't seem any hope or healing in the town. It just seemed so empty, like a ghost town. And so when I left there and all the way across the country, I kept thinking about that. And then we went on a, a I do a bereavement cruise too. Yeah. Well, tell me, tell me not to not to interrupt you too much. But when did you get the call from? Bob? That's when I said I'm on the bereavement Where cruise. Are you? Right there on okay. the cruise ship, and I'm ready to ready to leave the cruise ship. And, I, and Bob calls me because he, he said, "Mitch, you hear what happened?" He's Italian, so he talks like that. He said, "Mitch, what happened?" Well, I mean, look what happened, February 14th. And he said, "This is my hometown. What are we gonna do?" And so I. I said, Bob, we gotta have a day of healing. I said, I was in Sutherland Springs, nothing happened. Let's do, let's put our heads together and come up with something for the community because you were established there with your brick and mortar building 10 years ago. And I think that was meant for today. I really think this is in place, but no one knows about it. So let's make it available for everybody. Okay, now I wanna stop here and I wanna show that walk, but uh, a, a clip so people can get an idea. But then I wanna go to something else and Catherine and I were talking about it. How do you help people after trauma? How mm -hmm. do you enter that community? You mm -hmm. you can't just go in and you don't don't answer right now. We're going to see the Bobby Resonini. clip right now because he's in that community and I want people to see what Bob has done in honor of his son. It's an, and his wife, by the yes. way. It's not just, and his family. Oh yeah, Diane and Michelle yeah. and Nick. Yeah, the whole family has done this to honor other families. So let's watch that and then let's talk about, can you just get in your car and drive off somewhere? And uh, I mean, people, well, the people up in Sandy Hook were telling me that, that people sent them all these old clothes and all this stuff. I mean, what do people need? Can you go into communities? Let's talk about how that happens okay. and, and how people watching this show can actually help friends and family deal with trauma. So let's see that clip now. My life was going along just fine. Everything I wanted seemed to be mine. I was happy with every day, bringing me more of the same. How quickly things can change when someone you love is taken away. I know.
while I'm still hanging on to yesterday. And I know I'm gonna smile again, but I Oh, wow, Mitch, what a walk. And, and I just want to say we saw Bob and Diane, yep. and then we saw a picture you did of Bobby, and you Bobby. did a fabulous drawing yeah. of my son for me. You're such a talented artist. Oh, thank you. You are, and I think that's really powerful, that video, and kind of shows how everybody came together, because I think we heal in community. Yeah. And I think that's the power of the Compassionate Friends, Bobby Rossinini Foundation, and TAPS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. part of it. It's just another way of normalizing loss by giving people much information like doing videos or having whatever events you do, you right. let people know about it instead of keeping it in the background and I, mm -hmm. I'm excited about Well, let me say something though. You made a comment which I think is so true. Um, we need to tell people, you said to Bob, uh, you've got this wonderful resource and people don't know about it. Yeah. It is so hard to let people know about grief and loss resources. There are so many people that don't know about TAPS. I mean, because the media does not want to talk about hope and healing. They want to get there, they want to sit in people's yards and hide in their bushes and take <laughs> pictures of what's going on during mm -hmm. the event, the trauma, whatever. But the problem is, Healing takes a while. I always say to people, Heidi, who are therapists, because uh, I was a family therapist, is if you don't, uh, can't deal with long-term patients and, long, and have patients with trauma or whatever, you shouldn't be in the counseling business. Right. Because it's a long road. You don't go in five minutes after, do you, Catherine? No, it, and some people aren't ready to talk yet. They need some time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's knowing that you need to touch base, go back in again, check on them, see how they're doing, and recognize the signs and symptoms. You know, if they're not eating, they're not sleeping, if you, know, if you notice that they're struggling, um, reach out. And, and, um, but sometimes it takes people a while. They're not always ready to right away talk about So, So Catherine, I'm interested. So you work with military families that have had a loss? Yes, correct. I've and do you also work with the military? Yes, correct, yes. Okay, I think this is interesting because in the military there's kind of a stigma against seeking professional help. So I didn't know how you work with people when they, they first come in and, and you know make them feel safe and like you're not pathologizing sure. them. Yeah, and it is a real challenge. There is still a real stigma around it. The, the military um, and veteran population are doing a good job of trying to get rid of that stigma, but it still exists, unfortunately. Um, a lot of people will seek help outside of the actual military community because they feel safer in a community um, in a community provider setting versus the military. Uh, so it's letting them know resources are available and that it's a strength to reach out. That reaching out is, um, that having the courage and strength to reach out, is just like if you had a you know, broken bone, you'd mm -hmm. go and you'd get the broken bone fixed. So we're really trying to reduce that stigma and help people know that reaching out and getting help can help you heal. So, so we're looking at trauma. I just have one more question. We're looking at trauma today, and I'm thinking the Parkland situation and the military dying in action, those are, those are murders. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what I wanted to know is what do you both think is, how do you help someone after a murder and what do you think is unique in healing after the murder of a family member or friend? What, what is unique Why about that? Why don't you that? start with Mitch on that? Uh, it's uh, like not rushing in, I think. You know, it, um, I noticed that when we went to Sandy, Hound, Sandy Hook twice and everybody was paparazziized and hidden. And so I, I think it's to... Like in Parkland, we did body, mind, soul, and spirit. We had four villages, one for each one. And all, as you noticed, we were down there, and all the people that went to the different villages, but the body village was packed. You couldn't even get in there. And yet the talk therapy uh, village was almost empty. That's and such a good point. It showed that three months out, where they were three months out, that they were gravitating to where it was safe. They didn't They're have to They're just trying talk. to breathe. They're trying too. to breathe. And the benefit of that is that once they have good body work, they're so much internalized that it starts to come out, then it kind of primes the pump. So then they can do some talk therapy so, because so, now it's coming up. Okay, so now Mitch, I can when talk you say, about it. So when you say the body village, what exactly was that? We, you had, I was there, so you had you had art therapy. Yeah, we had the healing for the art hearts, heart, heart had, and art therapy, and then we had the, the healing haven, which was for body. We had Reiki, and we had massage, and we had meditation. 
meditation, we have yoga, so that people can just go and just and just feel and let the body and not speak. Let not speak. Just let the body recognize. You had, and there was drumming. And we had drumming, yes. And, With Josh and the drumming was fantastic because the, some of the students from Parkland came in and, you know, they were kind of quiet to begin with. But then when Josh does his magic with the drums, because it's not only drumming he, and making He makes drum, them out of He makes them out of five gallon buckets. Yeah, and yeah. They, they paint them. Yeah. They, and a lot, of the kids at the, a lot of the kids that were involved in the shooting. I don't, I'm not sure, but oh, a, a lot of the kids, a lot of the kids that were involved in uh, the shooting were there. Yes, and, and they were kind minutes, of oh, drumming were, with them. They were smiling and laughing, and because he was saying, "How do you if you can't communicate from here, you can communicate with the drums, right. you yeah. know?" And so you can get that anxiety out, you know. And it it was amazing to see the transformation of these young kids who were just kind of shy, and by the end they were laughing and you know. Hey, just, hey yeah. let's give a shout out to him. What's his last name? Josh Robinson. Josh yeah. Robinson. Yeah, yeah. You can go online yeah. and get him the, to come to your events. It, it, he is a, a wonderful soul mm -hmm. and really is into healing. So, yeah. Catherine, tell give us. Your comments. I know that uh, you do fabulous things at TAPS, these camps and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I've been very honored to work with TAPS um, and work with families with the traumatic loss and grief and see the strength, real strength in that community. Now, one of the things that happens in the military when there is a traumatic loss is they lose their community mm -hmm. because um, yeah. they have their, the military is their family per se because you know they're moving from location to location and they really become their support system and their communities. So when they, are, when they lose someone, they very well could lose that community on top of it. And TAPS really has done an excellent job of becoming that community and that family um, that understands and helps people feel less isolated through their trauma. Now people have to move after a year, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Don't they just give them a year? Yes, yeah. Uh, and they have to leave wherever they are and be out. And uh, that, that, that's, that's a that's huge really loss huge. because here you've had a death and then you, it's almost an identity loss. Right. And yes. losing your community. Yeah. All at the same time, which is pretty big. And, and the problem is, I found with, with Scott when my son was killed, is that Heidi went back to college and nobody knew him. Right. You know, and I was just thinking of you had that same kind of military kid kind of thing, even and, though. And it's a blessing and a curse. Because, you know, we want people to recognize, we want people to give us attention and recognize us and give us acknowledgement and validation, but then sometimes we want to be away from it too. We kind of mm. want moments where we take breaks. Sure. Um, it was very surreal though and strange. I mean, I was 20 when my brother died and people wanted me to grieve for about two weeks and then I was supposed to be back in the sorority acting like a normal, quote unquote, college student who hadn't had a loss. And that was never gonna happen again because I was profoundly changed as everybody is. Um, I think one of the interesting things about murder, and I am gonna keep bringing it up to mm. that because that's kind of a word that we wanna skirt around. Mm -hmm. When I worked with the fire department after 9-11, I worked with the families for 10 years in the FDNY, and I was very hesitant to say that their firefighter husbands and fathers had been murdered. Mm -hmm. So I would say that they died in the Trade Center, and the families took issue with that. And they said, Heidi, they didn't die in the Trade Center, they were murdered. You have to use that word because that is impacting the way that mm -hmm. we're grieving. We're very, very angry about what happened and we have to be able to address that piece and I wondered if lo working in trauma you've seen that. I've got to stop thoughts, one thought yeah. before we, we move into that. These are families, uh, when you ask that question, yeah. it's military families killed in active duty. Right, exactly. Because there are many ways to die in the military and that, that is also a problem I've heard is that um, there is a hierarchy about how you died. If you died on a motorcycle on leave mm -hmm. or if you died of cancer or whatever uh, you don't quite get the, you know, you don't get the heart, you know, the badges and, mm -hmm. and whatever. So there's that. But let's stick with the people who are killed in active yeah. duty because I think that's, a, that's good a good question. But I want everybody to know in the military we recognize, you know, you All and your loss yes. and, your, and the sacrifices mm -hmm. that your loved one have made. Be, be, just because they weren't killed in active duty it doesn't mean we don't totally value them. So, yes. like, yeah, as, let's as move on. As civilians we do and as civilians I didn't think it mattered. Because to me, if somebody dies, they die. But when I went into the military environment, they were like, Heidi, it matters in the military. I said, that's interesting, because as a civilian, it doesn't matter one way or another to me. Right. Your, your person served, and it was an amazing, admirable thing, and they died. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yes. So but anyway, good. You yeah. go on so, with that. Yeah, so, so back to the, the question of what? What was my question? You were that? asking them what would their take on uh, yes. murder. Yes, yes. 
do you see that people are, that's a piece of it? I, I definitely see that people wanting to make sense out of the loss. Okay. Now, sometimes with the military, because they serve, there's a great deal of pride in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I also think the making sense out of it still really exists. Mm -hmm. And um, the shoulda, woulda, couldas of, you know, of the process. And then a lot of times there's not a lot of information. Um, they, they may not get the information or they may not get their loved ones' um, remains back. So there's a lot of yeah, questions yeah. that are there mm -hmm. around the traumatic um, loss. And also, uh, I was talking to somebody whose son was killed on active duty, and she said one of the problems was that um, she couldn't talk to the people that died with, that lived, that saw him die. The military, uh, talks to them, debriefs them, and they're only allowed to say certain things. Right, because it's, it's, there's so much confidentiality when you yeah. are in the military. And, and she said it was so hard because they weren't, she knew they had more than they right. were giving her. So there's that, I don't know, secrecy component, which is also with the World Trade Center when these guys were flying airplanes in. I mean, the government wasn't talking about that for quite a while, how it happened, who they were. Now, now they're gleaning, you know, they glean more information. Now there are movies made on it. But there's a lot of secrecy can, uh, around grief and loss. Mm -hmm. And I see some, a comparison, like with, I work with TAPS as well, and, uh, and then with Parkland, and see that I think best, best friend loss is really is marginalized yes. and not really recognized. And so in the military, you have this cadre of friends that, I mean, that you work with all the time, your troop or whatever it is. And then I'm talking the, the grief of the, the, the comrades. And then in military, you know, if you show weakness, you may not get your promotion. So a lot of that, they don't just talk about it. And then they come home and they don't have their, their 12 guys or their troop to talk to that was their family. In the school, you've got all the kids that kind of keep it in because you're not going to show weakness. Boys don't show weakness. And so you, you, there's a... I see a similarity that because the, they lose well, their Parkland, friends. Well, Parkland, they did that big march and you know everything uh, for the gun control thing and all that kind of thing. So they, the kids, yes, the, the kids did a lot of activity around. And there's it. a lot of anxiety and angst between the two groups that the, the ones who were on the, in the news and talking about it weren't in Building 1200. And so the ones who were in Building 1200 are really upset with those. It's like a grief one-upmanship. Well, you weren't in the building. So they, there's a lot of uh, going back and forth in, in Parkland. Whose grief is more important. It, yeah. Absolutely. We saw that after 9-11 here in New York. There was, everybody was impacted in the world to, at some extent, but like you said, there were people that were there and then there are people that were somewhere else, and there was sometimes that that hierarchy and that competition of, well, I was there, you weren't there, kind of thing. Yeah, even the principal had said that with the faculty as well. Yeah. The faculty are arguing about well, you weren't in the building, you know, and the trauma was so much more intense. You know, the teacher, the, the principal said she, would, you know, saw a child laying there, you know, right. and she saw that, and she can't get that out of her head. And other people heard about it and knew it, but it's, so there's a, there's a difference. Well, in that. and I think you're making a good point with traumatic loss. Sometimes we get stuck in that trauma. And so I'm wondering for both of you, what do you think people, what helps people heal mm -hmm. after a traumatic loss? What have you seen, Catherine? Because I know you've worked with a lot of people that have had trauma. Yeah, and that's a very good point because unfortunately a lot of times people feel like, oh, I'm, I don't have the right to grieve because this mm -hmm. person has more of a right, right? So this, um, people being able to talk about it, being able to allow themselves to grieve and have compassion towards themselves. Mm -hmm. you know? I love that yes, compassion yes. towards yourself. You really that is have so to be, kind, be as kind yeah. to yourself as you would to somebody else who is grieving um, because we forget that in our grief. There's so much you know, energy and emotion around it that we forget to have that self-compassion. I feel like that opens up the doors to heal them because if you're having a bad day, mm -hmm. you are okay with it. You don't feel like you're not allowed to have a bad day. Um, and then being able to talk about it and then community support, things like TAPS, where people can go and have, have a community around them that truly understands mm -hmm. what they're going through and can be there. Now, mm -hmm. let me say something about TAPS while we're on that. Mitch, we want to get to you about some healing ideas. But one of the things I want to tell you about TAPS is that if you've been, if you have a family member who dies and they've been in the military, you can actually go to TAP. Yes, family or friend. So yeah. It could be a, could be a friend you too. You can go online. Mm -hmm. I mean, Donnie would probably take me if I went online and said my father was in World War II and I want to get, you know, the military was important to me. Uh, she has such incredible programs going on, and people just don't know that they can access them when maybe their dad died 10 years ago or in the military or whatever, you know, 
and they can go online and uh, yes. look at TAPS. It's open to family, friends who have lost someone, yeah. and um, you know they offer hope, healing, um, and help, and that's the, that's what they're. And really they get, take do. great trips. <laughs> <laughs> they do yeah, that they too. Do. They do. They take healing great retreats. trips, <laughs> healing retreats. They just took one to Sedona, which I thought was yeah. amazing because that's such a healing place. And yeah. they do such a great job with the the kids. Oh, so, do you want to give us some t some of your tips for healing? Uh, yeah, back. I call it proactive grieving. You know, just take this. You are the CEO of your grief, and and do. I like that, Mitch. I'm the not, CEO not, of my grief. Not, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> don't yeah, let anybody do. tell you how to grieve. And I always say, shine by example. You know, ah, let like people that. look at you because you can't make someone do something. You can't make a horse drink water, and that's true. You can't make someone grieve like you want them to grieve. But the, you want them to look and look at you and say, well. Wow, how was he doing? 30 years later, all these losses, how was he doing? They, then they asked me, instead of lecturing at them, just instill a curiosity of how you survived. And that, because then you're not pushing, then they come up and ask you, and then it's their prerogative. They're making the motion to move forward instead of pushing them forward. That's mm -hmm. great, Mitch. Well, how do we find you on the internet? Uh, my uh, stu uh, heartlightstudios.com is my website for, uh, I did Heartlight Studios because my son loved E.T. And so after he died, I had to do the turn on your heart light, which is the kind of the basis of proactive grieving is turn on your heart and let that heart shine for everybody. And so you can go to my website or Facebook. I have a Mr. Heartlight uh, YouTube as well. So I made all these uh, 50 videos for uh, on how to handle grief and loss, and you can watch it 24-7. So. Great. Thank you, Mitch. And Catherine, how about you? How do we get a hold of you? Um, I actually, through Awaken Wellness Center, that's where I've been doing um, for the past 15 years, the majority of my work with traumatic loss and grief um, and trauma, so that's the best way. Okay, so say what it is again. Awaken Wellness Center, like Awaken, um, A-W-A-K-E-N, Wellness Center. Wellness Center, like okay. It. Well, you guys are awesome, and it's great to have you on. And if you had one last piece of advice for those of grieving, what would it be? Um, give yourself time, and I like what you said, you know, know that there's, it's an individual process. Yeah. It's truly individual. That's what I was going to say. Nos que te ipsum. <laughs> the Latin for know thyself. Um, Find out who you are as a person, then you know how to handle it. Draw to your strength. Thank Love you it. so much for being on the show, Thank guys. Thank you. That was wonderful. Well, what great guys to have on today, huh? I love it. I love it. And I think uh, one of my takeaways is, you know, there's alternative. We need to take care of our bodies mm -hmm. and tr and work the trauma out of our bodies. Yeah. In, in, in any way that works yeah. for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And we hope that you'll let everybody know about Open to Hope because Misha was saying that people just don't know enough about what's going on out in the grief and loss world. And we've interviewed thousands of people and you can find it at opentohope.com. So please tell at least one friend about it this day and God bless.